Good morning, reactioneers, reactionaries. What's the what's the going term these days? Uh, my name is John, and today we are going to be doing a little bit of a talk here on building software like Pixar makes movies. And what would uh, well, first off, let me. I want to thank Nir. I also want to thank Gray Herter for having uh, put together this awesome conference and, and having me come speak. I've been I haven't been to a Nation JS in a while, but it's been. Uh, They've always been great and I've always enjoyed them. Uh, but what would a Pixar talk be without a good little uh, starting animation, right? What many people don't realize is that this is Luxo Jr., this little lamp. Luxo Jr. was one of the first pieces of animation Pixar ever made as a company and actually got an Oscar nod for. Uh, and, and we'll see through the future here that they are doing this on a constant basis and this is how they drive their technology forward. Uh, I am the VP of design at Powerfleet, which sounds better than it is. I am the entire design department. <laughs> and uh, I've, I come from a UX and Rails background, but I've done React, Angular, and I'm currently pulling my teeth on an Ember.js project. I also wrote this book with Bruce Williams. Uh, it's grossly out of date, but if you have Rails view questions, happy to talk about them. And I come to 3D from a really weird place. So I have a master's in architecture. I went here in DC to Catholic U for undergrad and grad. Um, and during school, that was in the late 90s, a lot more gray now, we did an immersive 3D design studio. So everything we did was done in 3D Studio Max in the computer. We had, a, uh, and this is back, like we're talking 400 megahertz Pentiums are top line workstations at this point. I think I was on a 133. I had a 10 second render at 640 by 480 pixels that took the entire of Thanksgiving break to render because <laughs> glass is hard. So for a decade or so after that, while I was doing web and doing print and doing all sorts of other media work and, and some software development, I was also doing 3D animation for architects and a lot of visualization. So this was the 2012 DC bid. We obviously didn't win it, but this was on the front page of the Washington Post. Everything in the bottom half is 3D and the one giveaway is that everyone here knows the Anacostia River is never that clean. I also founded this company in 97. This is where most of our 3D work has been done. Um, and we did a short in 2005. We did it on our laptops, ended up actually going to film with Pacific Title and everything and, and showing around the world. Uh, that got us a pitch with Blue Sky Studios, who uh, is part of Fox Animation. Um, and the director of this had a, an idea for a kung fu movie for kids, which was a great idea. And we, he had developed it all out. And the head of production took it to LA. And then on the front page of Variety, DreamWorks announces Kung Fu Panda. No competitive development. That He's still working on it on his spare time. He's a compositor in, in uh, Hollywood working at Weta. So anyways, I love 3D. I love Pixar. I love storytelling. But I have one thing to tell you up front here. I lied. This is not a talk about software. <laughs> it's a talk about how to manage creative endeavors. And I consider software a creative endeavor. Um, a couple of friends, when I first threw this title out, asked me if it was going to be uh, talking about getting to release in four years or if it was uh, making software that makes you cry for 20 minutes but everything works out okay in the end. It is neither. Uh, and, and we don't have 47 minutes of you know, no dialogue before we have some words in the, the movie. But creative, when we say creative, this is not, often that gets kind of derided. It's like, oh, you're creative. You make pretty pictures. Pixar as a company is not just made up of, of image mongers. They are made up of everything that you would think of in our current working environments. They're, it is a software and hardware development company. It's less hardware these days, mostly just software. They have project managers, or they, have, uh, they have their artists, they have their engineers, they have unit production managers, which is kind of like our PMO. Uh, and it's, it's amazing to see that what they have learned managing large scale creatives at a dollar value that most of us find mind boggling and what we can apply there. So we're gonna break this up like a good hero's journey into three parts. We're gonna have a history lesson because a lot of these things that we understand, they learned the hard way. Then we're gonna talk about people and candor, which really focuses on how we work. And then we're gonna talk about making space, which actually focuses on where we work and how environment has a serious impact on our, our work. So a brief history of almost everything. I'm a sucker for origin stories. So it's difficult to talk about without getting to this stage again. So we're gonna to rewind to 1972. I don't know if, how many of us were actually born in 72? Handful maybe? Two? <laughs> this is Ed Catmull. Ed Catmull is uh, about to retire as the president of Disney and Pixar Animation. And uh, he's a computer scientist whose work you use every day and you would never know it. Um, he is also seen as being instrumental in Steve Jobs' sojourn away from Apple and 
the things that apparently, uh, there's a lot of conjecture, Jobs never said this, but numerous people point to the, the, the things that were being learned at Pixar at the time when Jobs owned it and how he changed his management style when he came back to Apple from that. So 1972, University of Utah, what is that? Well, it's one of the first nodes on ARPANET. And uh, the, uh, Ed Catmull is in the comp sci program here working on computer graphics. So this is one of the first pieces of computer visualization. This is his hand. Uh, and now this at this time is not render it and play it back on your hand, on your computer screen. Everything here is painstakingly done, printed to film one frame at a time and then projected on an old school projector. So let's watch a little bit here. So what they do is they're, you're seeing his hand and it's gonna rotate around. What happens here is that this is all polygons. This is polygonal modeling. This is the first way they've done modeling. And in order to do it, they have to go ahead and draw every polygon on a physical model of his hand and then trace it with a digitizer. So each one of those is what we call a face and they all connect together. And then once they go through and digitize it, which we'll see here in a minute, they have like an X, Y, table, for lack of a better word. Fun times right there. So that turns into a wireframe, which we'll talk a little bit about. Here we go. So that's all the polygons. And now the next step is that it is shaded. And this is a basic light and a basic surface. So the biggest problems with a lot of things at this time is uh, when you have, like think about it, if you move your hand and deform it, your skin kind of bunches up. The computer doesn't, you have to tell the computer how to do that. It's gotten a lot better nowadays, but in 1972, there was no, like, check the smart box. No, there was none of that. Everything was painstakingly done. So you'll have weird folds. You have, like, things that just show up and, and, and vertices fold in on each other and things break. So all of this stuff, just to have the hand go like this and open up again was, like, thesis-level work. So all these things are developed in the early 70s here. Polygon modeling, subdivision surfaces, what happens when those things bend together? How do you break up a surface into multiple smaller pieces? Texture mapping, how do I project a texture? If you've ever played any game in a 3D environment, you're looking at texture mapping. It's, it's a sphere, but then there's something on it. That's basic texture mapping. It gets far more complex. Set extensions in movie are really complex texture maps. Um, and then Z-buffer, Z-depth, we use this all the time in CSS. So this is, coming, this is invented at this time. Uh, and at this time, Ed also went down to pitch, you know, being a, a doctorate, he's going down and pitching companies on who could use this tech. He goes to Disney. Disney is like, we have no idea what this is. We don't, we don't get it. The last tech, you know, Disney's still riding high on the end of the, 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 the Great Nine and all that stuff. And they have, uh, the big tech leap was about a decade earlier with 101 Dalmatians. That was the last big tech leap they had done. So they're just like, yeah, we're good. I mean, 10 years in animation, that it takes four years to do a product. That's not too long. Uh, but we'll come back and see how Disney comes around. So 1974, Ed's finishes grad work. He goes to the New York Institute of Technology and is charged with making an animated movie of something. And he goes out and just says, I can't do this myself, starts hiring really smart people. This is Alvy Ray Smith. This is a recent image of him. I don't have a, a 70s one of him by himself. And Ed is quoted as saying, all these people he hired can swim circles around him. And they are far more talented than he is. And it's like the biggest imposter syndrome you've ever heard. And he's sitting there. You know, this is, this is a guy who invented foundational CG stuff saying how much he is a, a bad developer, basically. Um, and what it ended up, he ended up realizing at this time is something that a lot of us who end up going from being a individual contributor to a manager role end up realizing is like your job is not to be the best. Your job is to enable those who can do that work to do it and encourage them and collaborate with them. And so a couple things come out here. First is tweening. Tweening is when you say, like if you think about CSS animations, point A, point B, keyframe animation. Tweening is what happens in between. And then motion blur. So if you have keyframes, you go, here's this and here's this, and it goes chop, 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 chop. Motion blur blurs it, so when you pause it in the middle, it's actually a blurry image. It's what your eye would see in camera if it was filmed. So our first little learning, you'll see these throughout the talk, is we're gonna hire the best people we can and go super, super fast. And our job is not necessarily to be the best person, it's to find them and enable them to get the job done. 77, 
Besides being the year I was born, something important happens here, right? Everybody knows this one. Um, but uh, industrial light and magic comes a knocking. Lucas had built this and it was all practical. Everything here, we're building models, we're doing things in camera, we're using an optical printer where I'm taking multiple pieces of film and putting them together into a new piece of film. <clears throat> and like a photocopier, this starts to show its, uh, you photocopy, 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 you start to see edges, you start to see things don't look so good. Uh, it, it, you can only go take this so far before you destroy the original image and things get flattened out. Uh, so if you've ever watched the original, original, original before Lucas redid it 17 times of Star Wars, you'll notice there's a lot of stuff with like the Death Star sequence, especially where the, the, the planes are coming, you know, the, 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 the TIE fighters are zooming around, everything's kind of choppy and chunky. That's, that's issues of optical printing. So at this point, Lucas is like, I want to see what I can do. So he basically goes and uh, gets Catmull from NYIT, and he hires this team that he's built there, because NYIT was like, we don't know what you're doing. We don't, this isn't working out. So, and he wants to change the way he makes films. So he's working on Empire Strikes Back, at the point, this is Sergei Eisenstein, a famous early Russian filmmaker. This is an edit table. This is how film and audio, to a lesser extent, are edited. You find the frame, you cut the, between the two frames with the razor blade and tape it together. Everything is super destructive. The phrase on the cutting room floor is because you had film scraps all around you. So he said, how can I use a computer to edit? They create this thing, they call it DroidWorks. <clears throat> What's fascinating is that they took it to the editors. The editors were like, this isn't film editing. They'd done no research. Or they'd done research, but not, they didn't have buy-in. So half the time we're doing these big leaps in technology. It's not just that we can, but it's selling the vision of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if, <laughs> if your team that you take your product to refuses to even try it out, might have failed on the vision part. So uh, they also invented blue screen which is now, you know, we now use green screen because blue draw, draws all the color out of people. So uh, blue screen technology and other things like that. And they built the Pixar image computer. Pixar, the word is originated here from the Spanish verb Pixar to make pictures and radar kind of mashed together into a product name. It's a two foot cube, less power than the iPhone one. And at the time it was only used for super complex image processing. Um, it was mainly being sold into medical facilities. There were only about three to 400 ever made. So if you ever find one, grab it and I will gladly pay you for it. It's just a big paperweight at this point, but it looks really cool. So this is the kind of work they were doing. This is called the road to Point Reyes. Reyes is, Point Reyes is an area in the Bay Area of California. Um, and this is, super cutting edge at the time. We have reflections in the water down here, but the reflection's not just a mirror. It actually is taking ripples into effect. It's transforming the visual. You've got translucency here with your, your rainbows. You have the sfumato effect as you go back, the Michelangelo style painting effect, if you see from the Renaissance where things get uh, more faded out as you get towards the horizon. You've got uh, fractal mapping here on the, uh, the rock, which gives it the, the depth. It's not just a smooth rock face, it's all formulated. And so the first time we see this in film is this sequence. Oops, oops, that was auto start. Uh, let's try that again. There we go. So Wrath of Khan. <laughs> this is the Genesis effect sequence. Everything you're seeing here was rendered out of the Reyes algorithm. And then this awesome Spoilers. fake computer on the sides. <laughs> Sorry? Spoilers. Spoilers, yeah. If you haven't seen the Wrath of Khan, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's as old as most of us. <laughs> but see, here, all, all of these things coming up now, if you think about this, every, you're seeing 30, 24 to 30 frames a second. Every one of those frames is, mis, is like painfully done by hand at this point. Um, so the, the things we're getting out of here is, you know, out of the early Lucasfilm days, blue screen, chroma keying, uh, Nonlinear editing, which is DroidWorks, which is now Final Cut, or even you can do this now on your phone. You can do the, you know, you sit there and make a quick movie edit in YouTube Studio or something. That's, this was all originated here. So 1983, Disney finally comes around. They send up their animation team to see what's going on at Lucasfilm. And Lucas had intentionally placed his facility out of LA. He is an hour flight, he's in Marin County. So it's an hour flight easy to get to him. So you can get there, but it's not easy. So one of the animators is a man named John Lasseter. And um, now we're at 20 years since they've had a big, big breakthrough. 
the famous nine animators are now kind of in management positions. They're not really doing anything. This is kind of a dead zone for Disney animation, the early 80s. And apparently Lasseter stands there looking at this picture on the wall for 15, 20 minutes. And Catmull comes up and talks to him and he's just fascinated with it. He just can't imagine this came out of a computer. So they go back down. Lasseter has been working on a, a pitch. He pitches it. It's called the Brave Little Toaster. He's summarily fired later that day. And about a week later, Catmull calls him back up and says, hey, heard you were fired. Uh, we've got this project we're working on. You want to come up and work? And he pretty much moves to Marin County immediately. Great. I'll be there tomorrow, I think was the quote. So this is the graphics group at Industrial Light and Magic. You've got Alvy Ray Smith holding the clicker, Ed Catmull to his left, John Lasseter to his right, and a bunch of other talented guys. And so they're working on something for SIGGRAPH. Anybody ever heard of SIGGRAPH? It is the annual graphics. It still happens today. It's like if you want to find out about cutting edge computer graphics, it's the conference. So it happens every year and, and people are presenting like how they're fixing now. Nowadays it's all about like getting more real humans or things like that are starting to be, oh, those are kind of the talks. But at this point, a lot of SIGGRAPH is, look, I made this animation of Voyager going past Jupiter. And that's about it. So they're trying to show their technology, their rendering technology, the algorithm, and they've been working on this story and it just doesn't work. And it's Andre and the bee. <clears throat> and they brought Lasseter and he's like, well, there's no story. So Lasseter brings story to the image group and why would anybody care about this? Hmm. So we're gonna watch this real quick. Halfway through, they ran out of time. So the second half of the animation was done as wireframe. This is the final, but it's really short, but there's a story, you've got complex camera moves, You've got shadow. You've got character, most importantly. bad choice. <laughs> so the credits are as long as the whole animation. <laughs> we'll skip those. <laughs> but this is wireframe. So the movie switches to this halfway through. But people had been invested in that just a little bit of story. But they were invested in what was going to happen that they didn't care. They didn't notice that it had switched to wireframe. They were still like, oh, that's great. So here's where I start to uh, push some buttons. So for all the care you put into visual artistry, visual polish doesn't matter if you're getting the story right. Now before you all thumb your nose at your design staffs, awesome technology doesn't matter if you're not getting the experience right. It was an enjoyable experience to watch that short. Therefore, it didn't matter that the tech fell apart halfway through. So none of our end users care that we are building in the coolest, newest component system or whatever. They just want it to work. That component system allows us to do amazing things. And we can deliver amazing experiences, but the experience is key. The tech serves that. 1985, uh, George Lucas has decided that he, he's going through a divorce, needs to sell off a bunch of stuff to pay and go through the legal issues there. And Jobs is out of Apple. He started next, and he sees the image group at, as like another high-end computer, like the next workstation. So Jobs buys it for $5 million, throws another $5 million at R&D, and leaves him alone. He just kind of goes off and, and focuses on Next and lets Catmull and his team do their R&D thing. And he's thinking, this is a high-end computer. We're going to sell millions of them, standard Jobs distortion field. So Pixar at this point is a hardware and software R&D company, right? Remember, we got about three to 400 of these total ever built. So they're probably halfway through that production cycle at this point. So Ed's trying to figure out ways how to integrate ways of running team, improvement of production. There's a lot of just like brokenness of how, I mean, it's a small group, but you know, it's kind of a, been an ad hoc system of putting things together. So he starts looking into people like the Toyota production system and, and then W. Edward Stenning, who is a gentleman that in uh, the 1940s helped rebuild Japan. 
and one of the things he was was really known for is this uh, total quality control mantra but um, that he worked up with uh, Akio Morita of Sony. And um, the responsibility of fixing a problem is everybody's issue. There's not just a QA person. Everybody is responsible for being a QA person kind of thing. So if you think about this in the production line, everybody had the, the right to stop the line, which was unheard of in 1945, 1950. This was crazy talk. But what they did is that the, everybody was in, emotionally invested in the end product and it improved worker productivity. So workers engagement results in, you know, is a strength, it strengthens the resulting product. So when we have people that don't feel that they can communicate and say, hey, I was looking at this and I got some ideas. That's great, that's not your team, stay in your lane. That hurts our product development cycles. That hurts our end product. In 1987, Luxo Jr. First astronaut for a short. Uh, and basically, if you haven't seen this, it's a mama lamp and a baby lamp, and the baby lamp jumps on the ball and squishes it, which is where the jumping on the eye comes from. Um, but it's, this was like an old drafting lamp that they had on their desks as animators and they animated it and gave it such personality. Uh, 1988, they actually win an Oscar for this, which I was like, you're like, what? <laughs> the room looks okay. Toys look pretty good. What is up with that baby? <laughs> Freaky. But this is, you know, this is, rendering humans is hard. And this is, yeah, 19, you know, this is not the good thing. But the, this is the shorts, this is what I was talking about early on. Every year, year and a half, they're putting out a new short. They're pushing their technology. This is their R&D, but it's also their team development. It's really affordable to put, try out a new leader on a short. So they'll take an animator, and he or she will become the director for that short. Five minutes of animation. If it flops, it flops. But we, what did we learn, right? So this is kind of what we think about when we're talking about prototypes or sprints or any of these kind of little things. Like how can we not just learn from our tech runs, how can we actually put people in positions where they grow while we do that? So if we're going to run a sprint, maybe the team lead chooses somebody and says, hey, you're going to run this sprint. And it's a mentoring opportunity. Lots of prototypes, though. Think about like from our, from our side of the world, uh, clickable prototypes, something with Framer, something with uh, uh, Sketch and, and Marvel, or any of these uh, Envisions, another you know, th thing like Marvel you can use. Um, paper prototypes, literally cut and paste, put it on the table, rearrange the page. Well, all these things are very low cost, high benefit things that we can do early in the process to learn a lot before we commit to a huge build. <clears throat> Again, not so good on the sales numbers here, 1989. Steve Jobs is trying to sell Pixar. He's like, I don't know if this is working. This is not what I thought it was. But what, every time he gets close to a sale, he backs out. He goes to Bill Gates. Bill Gates offers him a lot of money. And then he's like, oh, OK, well, if it's worth that for Bill, then it's got to be worth whatever. So again, Jobs never wrote down or said if he actually meant to sell it or if he was just trying to, to justify to himself his purchase. But that's what they, they've got. And now we have one of the first big pieces of software success come out of Pixar, CAPS, besides the algorithm. But computer animated production system is sold to Disney. And this is the first big jump. So we're 30 years past 101 Dalmatians now. This allows for coloring of cells in the computer. So every animation cell normally is colored by hand. What this also allows is some of those things such as that we assume just to be normal in Photoshop these days of transparency, translucency, transfer modes, all these things are enabled in caps. So the first scene done with this is the last scene in Little Mermaid. And this usher, where, so you have the, the rainbow you can see through. And this ushers in a whole new wave of Disney animation. And so starting in the, the early 90s, we've got Little Mermaid, we've got The Lion King, all these things hit. And a lot of them, you could attribute that the, the tech let them do some things they couldn't, couldn't do before. So 91, Disney's like, all right, we like these guys. They're doing some great work for us. Can, do, can you guys do an animated feature film? Yeah, we can do that. Disney wanted to buy the tech, though. They wanted Pixar's entire technology stack. And Steve Jobs was like, nope, nope, not going to do it. These are not the droids you're looking for. You're going to give me a three-picture deal. I keep all the tech. OK. He somehow convinced them to do it. Again, reality distortion field, whatever works. So, while they're working on this feature film now, two years in, they win the Oscar for Render Man. <clears throat> Render Man has won, uh, this is Terminator 2, by the way, if you don't know what this is from. 
uh, the entire, all the mercury, that whole, the, the whole T2 transforming thing that was all done out of RenderMan. Uh, pretty much every film, with the exception of two or three, that have won the, tech, the Oscar for Best Visual Effects, uh, they all use RenderMan. It's, it is the industry standard in rendering, and, it, and this is where it really comes into its own. Uh, so they're working on Toy Story at this point, right? But it's not the Toy Story we know. They're doing what they call storyboards. So they're draft, like sketching a frame, they're putting it into the editor, and then they're having the actor's voice along with it. So you kind of get the idea of the story without spending all the time animating every frame. So we're gonna watch something. This was on the Blu-ray when they re-released it, and um, it's a disaster. This is the reel that we showed on Black Friday before we re-envision Woody's character. It's, um, you know, it's bad, you know, <laughs> it's really bad. Um, it's kind of rough to watch these days. But hey, okay. for history's sake, I think it's important to see, you know. Um, so uh, this takes place right before they go to Pizza Planet, and all of the other toys are placing bets is to 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 see who Andy's going to take, either Woody or Buzz Lightyear. Woody, ah, ah. I just like to wish you luck. I I. I know you'd do the same for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, well, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Whoa! Oh! Throws it out the window. <laughs> what? 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 What are you? What's everybody looking at? What? Hey, he slipped. I tried to. He, I couldn't hold that. It wasn't that. He slipped. I <laughs> <laughs> think he fell onto the street. He's going to drug him. He ain't going to pizza now. Woody, you can rip it and throw Buzz out the window. Hey, it's a toy, toy world. Oh. Now, boy, where is your honor, dirtbag? You are an absolute disgrace. You don't deserve to wear a 10-gallon hat on your pint-sized head. Men, search and rescue. I want a medevac team on the double. That's the one. Move it, move it, move it. Hey, hey, blood for brains. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? Off the bed. Hey. Pretty dark version of Woody, huh? <laughs> so what had happened is they've been doing what are called, not dailies, but it's basically they're going down and showing the film progress at, at Disney. And they're getting notes. Notes is just a, you, you show something and somebody says, oh, what about this? What about this? You should try this. They kept saying, make Woody harder. Woody needs to be more hip. And Woody needs to be harder, more, more strong, more mean. And they kept following... To a fault, the suggestions of the Disney executives. And this is where they ended up. And Katzenberg says, we're done. This is not a movie. What happened? Your, your production is stopped. He was, in fact, ready to shut the entire movie down and, and chalk it off to uh, an R&D experiment gone wrong. And Lasseter says, give me two weeks. And they're talking, and, and apparently, in, in some of this other footage you, you can watch if you're really into the stuff like I am, uh, one of the, uh, Katzenberg turns to one of the other execs and says, what happened? Like, how did this happen? He's like, they made the movie you told them to make. They followed every note you gave them to a fault. So they go back and they do what is considered the founding of what they ended up calling it the brain trust. They get all their best story people in a room, they lock the door, and they fix the story. And it, it's turned out to be Toy Story, and we, I mean, it's one of the best animated films ever made, so there we have it. But a lot of these things is going down rabbit holes. You have to try all these different things out. We're gonna fail, but we have to learn from those failings. Far too often, people go down a rabbit hole of development, we try something out, and it's thrown away, and nothing's documented, nothing's saved, nothing's understood. So every time we're trying something out, or every time we get to a point in a project where it's like, stop, what happened here? Too often, we just jump onto the next thing. We don't have time to, to do a retrospective. We don't have time to figure out where this went wrong. If you don't do that, you, learn, you don't just lose the code you wrote. You lose all the time invested in that code. You lose all the team knowledge. And half of those engineers, this happened at Living Social, we spent a year working on a new scheduling system. Nobody told us about nine months through that the business decided to change the way they scheduled things. We're happily coding away, doing a prototype, built out the interface, almost ready to tie it into the API. Oh, we're gonna shut this down. No warning, no nothing. Two of the four engineers left over that. 
So we not only lost everything we learned about that and about, about that interface and about working in a pub sub environment, and this is, too, this is early pub sub, you know, this is before we had a lot of these things standardized, we lost engineers because they were so heartbroken over having their work basically just thrown in the trash can with no, no good explanation, no understanding, no reuse. So half the time we're going, we're not always going to write the best thing first. But the point of being a creative manager and running creative teams and working on creative teams is we have to protect the future, not the past. So we have four Toy Story movies now. Obviously it worked out okay. The way out is often through, which is difficult, especially when you're in the middle of it. And also, sometimes your VCs are gonna be wrong. The Disney execs didn't know, they thought they were giving the right note and they, they gave the wrong note and they turned the, the movie into a horrible thing. So take advice, but understand that you have the product vision and at the end of the day, you are responsible for executing on it. So 95, we're almost done with our history segment. Jobs decides right before opening weekend, he's gonna IPO Pixar. So he does and he makes a metric ton of money. Um, he knows that we're going to be doing two more films with Disney. He wants to negotiate from a position of power. This IPO enabled them to not take a penny from Disney. So he said, Eisner's going to call. He's going to come up. He wants to renegotiate. Trust me. And he did. And Jobs basically said, and again, this is what I want. And he got it. <laughs> so <laughs> he, Jobs is also a 70%-ish owner of Pixar stock at this point, too. Um, so Pixar ends up being bought by Disney, but it's more of, it almost feels like Pixar acquired Disney animation in a way, the way it worked out. But um, so this is how Jobs ends up becoming the largest shareholder in Disney too. So when you have a win, leverage it. Always negotiate from a position of power. Uh, it's an interesting quote just from personal development. Uh, somebody once told me the, the, when you're doing a, a new uh, job search, the most power you have in negotiation is the day before you accept the offer letter. All right, so that is the end of phase one. That's our brief history, well, very long history segment. Um, people and candor. So when working with people, a lot of the things that we learn from how Pixar works actually come down to interpersonal relations. Um, candor is the important word here. Uh, people can be too honest. Honesty can have a negative connotation. Like, man, that person was way too honest with me in that meeting. Like, but it's very hard to be too candid. So if you start to transfer the way we talk about things and also the way you think about feedback, this is important. So uh, at the end of Toy Story, the unit production managers, our PMO, was fed up. They wanted to all quit. In Hollywood at the time, the mentality was you never rock the boat during production. You just get to the end. Kind of sounds like development sometimes. They had an open door policy. They had all these things they thought would fix this from happening. But there was a stronger culture of don't rock the boat. So it ended up being a great quote that from Ed Catmull, if you have more truth in hallways than in meetings, you have a serious problem. So they changed the way they did feedback. They started something called notes day, same way that they were getting notes. They then said, we want every employee to give the company notes on how the company can be better. You don't like the food in the lunchroom? Great. Bring it to notes day. You don't like the way that this project was managed because of this. Great, bring it to notes day. You don't like that your computer broke down and it took three weeks to get it fixed. Bring it to notes day. You can always go in, but we have a formal process now that this is where you're supposed to complain. Jobs was also notorious for jumping in on uh, daily screenings where they put up what they worked on the day before in the morning. Jobs would walk into the theater to a small team of maybe 20 people and say, what's one good thing about Pixar? What's one bad thing about Pixar? And then he would like take those internal notes and then he'd go and find the person who was responsible for that and say, let's fix this. So at first people were like, no, no, everything's great, man. Everything's wonderful. I love working here. You know, you don't, don't rock the boat. But then they realized, no, he really, and he would be like, no, no, no softballs. Like something is bad here. Tell me what it is. And that was something that really changed the way they did it. So in our world, we can do those things if we, we have to make them happen though. We have retrospectives. We can make a note stay. We can make formal feedback but we can have informal feedback too. And it's, it's difficult to do, especially in organizations that are super hierarchical. It's almost, I think it'd probably be almost impossible to implement this in the US government, unfortunately, uh, from my brief experience with some Department of Transportation contracting, just because the, the nature of the system is so different. 
But if you're in a smaller engineering team, you maybe just do this on your team. Uh, and if, you know, in the, same, in the same way that, you know, we're supposed to have 50, uh, 50 laboratories of liberty in the states that each team can come up with something and try something out. This worked great. Hey, we're now going to run this on other teams and see how this works. So try things, document them, see what they do. <clears throat> Jumping down here, people would work on projects and they would have new directors and new directors would fail horribly and they weren't sure why. Uh, and the director was getting so far into the process they got lost. Uh, and so what they developed is they took what happened with Toy Story and they made it a formal process called the Brain Trust. So the Brain Trust <clears throat> is just a group of individuals, rotating team. It effectively is the best storytellers in Pixar, whoever that may be, who's available at the time. And they can't be, usually they're not involved on that film. So they have no power to mandate. They only make suggestions. They can't say you should do this, but they, their goal is to identify the problems in the story before it gets to lockdown, to picture lock. So what are ways that we could do that? Well, we have a thing called pull request workflow, right? How many people are on your pull request workflows? How many people are asked to review your code? How many of those people are outside of your team? How many of those people are maybe in a different language? and can see things that you can't see. Throw, throw a Rubyist at JavaScript and watch them scream. <laughs> Me. It, like, what is this? Why is this here? Why is this here? This is so confusing. Can we write this cleaner? Because in Ruby, everything is so super opinionated that there's this, this right way to do it. And in JavaScript, it's like, yeah, man, whatever you want. Do anything. <laughs> but I just want a way to do it. All right. But, this, getting, getting those very disparate viewpoints coming in, changing everything onto its head. And start this off early. You don't have to create a pull request once the code's done. Create the pull request first. I'm going to be building this feature. This is the pull request. There's no code in it yet. It's a draft. Push, push, push. Constant feedback, constant feedback loops. Fix the problems before they happen. And also, if you're a team lead, and say so you've got your strong suit. And then another person on your team, say she's got a whole different suit that like really augments yours perfectly. Co-team leads. Or figure out a way to create a position that doesn't have to be a management position, it can be a technical position, where you augment your weaknesses. So build your own brain trust for how your team works. There is no right answer here. Try things out, they may fail, they may break horribly. What did I learn? Do it again. Kind of building on some of the things we've talked about here, if there's people in your organization that feel that they are not free to put ideas in, you're going to have, you're not going to be as successful as possible. Uh, Ed Catmull throws out the extreme example in, in his mind of like, the janitor should be able to give you feedback. So a lot of these things come down to fear. Like, if I rock the boat too much, I won't have a job tomorrow. That's scary. So how do you take fear out of the equation? How do you make, I hate the word, but how do you make a safe space for collaboration? Just because it's politically loaded. But how do you make a space for collaboration where people are enabled to come in and say, I'm going to be able to say something and it's not going to be offensive and it's going to be, I'm going to help this product forward. Uh, and a great example of it, this is also something to train your team on. The way we say things in feedback can really hurt when we don't mean to. Um, part of this is imposter syndrome. Part of this is, is as creative people, we are emotionally invested in the code and the creative work we make. And one way to do this is I, I did some work at Guggenheim Securities and the product manager there was a developer. And we were doing UX screens. And he would come up, and when we were off, we missed the mark. He would, he would always start with, I love you. I don't love this. <laughs> but, boom, immediately, I'm not getting fired. I'm, you know, this is okay, but we missed the mark on the, 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 the concept. All right. Immediately cut off all, like, all of those issues that if he would have just said, this is wrong. Oh, I'm a horrible developer. I can't do anything right. All those voices that drive us crazy. 
drive me crazy. Maybe not. You, maybe you don't have that, but I have a really bad issue with that. So it work, it's one of the things. Figure out ways you can talk in a safe way, in a safe environment, in an environment where people are encouraged to be collaborative and positive. Yes and is another way we phrase this in UX. So you can't say no, or that sucks, or that's awful. It's yes, but have you thought about what happens when it does this? Or that's cool, and what happens then when I add this on top of it? Or hey, that's great, can we do this too? Uh, it immediately forces you to be collaborative as opposed to destructive. Sorry to belabor that point, but it's, <laughs> it's been a big one. Um, again, looking at, if we look at the, um, this is kind of ch stretching this. As a manager from a creative management team lead role, a lot of people aren't comfortable giving those ideas out. So we have to be more focused on dragging feedback out of people, more, um, What's the right word here? Coercive, it, it, that's the wrong word, but we, we, want, we want to be like, no, I really need you to tell me what's going on. I really need you to tell me what's going on. And it really is about you know, getting these people involved in the process and getting our teammates to want to work with us. And it, that takes trust. That takes, and that, but trust doesn't happen without being able to feel like you can have candor and work through things. So how do you also build team outside of just, okay, we have a meeting tomorrow? Uh, one of the things they've done that worked really well is Pixar University. So it's completely unrelated to code, completely unrelated to making movies. They are going to have a pottery night. And you have somebody from accounting next to somebody from animation, next to somebody from PMO, next to somebody from facilities, and they're all making pottery and talking. So getting, again, cross-pollination of ideas. We'll, we'll see one. I, <laughs> Jobs wanted to have one bathroom in the new Pixar facility, so everyone had to go to a central place and run into each other and wait in line. Didn't happen, thank God, but it's the mentality of like forcing, how do I force collaboration? You know, some things, let's try some things. So render, uh, Pixar Man, I'm sorry, Pixar's Render Man, 27 of the last 30 films for visual effects used this as their renderer. This is a basic shader, this is code. So a shader is what tells the renderer what to put on the screen pixel by pixel. So this is, uh, at the top we're saying, okay, the projection, it's a, Perspective with a 45 degree angle field of view. The format is 512 pixels square. Uh, and then I'm gonna translate and rotate some things with the camera. Uh, then I'm going to say, here's my output file. Then I define the world. I've got three light sources, uh, which are three different spots. Anyone who's ever done camera lighting, you get three, typically three spotlights or, and they, they are different intensities to give a good lighting setup. And then we have one here that's commented out that's an ambient light that would just kind of cast a glow throughout. <clears throat> And then we talk about a surface. The surface is gonna be a plastic, which is defined in the renderer. And then I've got two spheres. One's a sphere, one's squished. So that's a super simple, this is like, this is called sphere.rib. This is like what you test RenderMan with to make sure your install worked. But uh, this is how they used to write every single thing. Every shader was written like this to go into the renderer. So animation was really a, uh, a computer software discipline early on. And now, all these things have become sliders. This is a skin shader nowadays. Every one of these things has multiple sliders or parameter fields, various key value pairs set up throughout this that all feed the end result. And then when it comes out of the renderer, we're coming out in all these different passes, all these different ways to show, put things together. And what that enables them to do is spend a lot more time out of the renderer and a lot more time in what's called a compositor where they can tweak these layers without all the time the computer has to process the shot again. Let's talk about tech jumps here. Toy Story 1 at the top, Toy Story 4 at the bottom. That is not a photograph. That is a complete render. Toy Story 1 at the top, Toy Story 4 at the bottom. Andy got a facelift. <laughs> what's amazing now is that the tools the animators use look like Toy Story 1. That is what they see real time from the computer graphics card on their workstations. So that, I mean, 25 years of development, right? That's what we get. But every year they're doing a new movie. You remember they're doing a new short. This is Piper. This is what allows them to do. And now they've built the technology they need to tell the stories they want to tell. So for us, we have a pretty good tradition of open source. We could always be better. So what are the tools that you need to build in order to ship? And can you share those tools with the world? And if so, can you create that feedback loop? All sorts of things happening. Research. User research for us. 
ethics are and research is crucial to our storytelling. And with Coco, we got to visit the beautiful country of Mexico. So before they've even started the script, they have a treatment, they have a concept. So it was really important to us to They're going and learning. They're in just sucking everything in they can. Photographs, sketches, interviews, everything. Multi-generational family businesses of shoemakers. For art, for story and characters, it was just so informative. We were experiencing the colors and the smells and the sights and this incredible food. Cats and more. Look at this. Yes. So how many times do we work on a project where somebody's like, no, no, I know what we need to build here. We don't need to talk to the users. Ever hear that before? And those early research trips not only inspired the look, but they inspired the story and the importance of family. Do you mind? <laughs> All right. So oh, come on backwards. There we go. So it, this is this is critical. And I see this. So many software projects fail because they don't ever talk to the user. There, or there's one person that gets to talk to the user. Go sit with your users where they are using your software. That is rarely in a usability lab. It is often like you're checking the bus schedule. You're on a phone. It's noisy. It's not a nice clean area. It's not something pristine. You're distracted. You've got a kid that's pulling on your leg or something else. Or you're trying to figure something out while you talk to a friend. You've got to test and try things out in those areas. You've got to be with your users in those areas and understand their needs. Think about weather apps. You go to Dribbble. Everyone's designed the best weather app ever. They're all these super pretty screens. They are all awful. What does my wife ask me every morning? What's the weather like today? What does she want to know? Is it raining? And what do I need to put the kids in? What are our clothes? Do they need a jacket, basically, is, is the thing. Dark Sky is the only one that really effectively gets you that information quickly. So think about this stuff. Get in your user's world as much as you can. All right, we'll finish up here with making spaces. So st coming from an architecture degree, I have obnoxiously strong opinions here. This is Living Social's old offices. This is over at uh, the SunTrust building across from the uh, Treasury. This was awful. This was horrible. This was a cacophony of noise. Every surface was hard. Everything reflected sound. And thankfully, this is coming into a world where everyone's like, yeah, these don't work as well as we thought. Every engineer had headphones on. The other half of the floor was sales who were all yelling on the phones to somebody. <laughs> half of the engineers started working remote just because of this. So when we're talking about space, like this is, this is Pixar's campus in Emeryville near Oakland. Uh, the main building is what most people have seen. Um, we're going to look at kind of that in the side building real quick. But Jobs was the primary designer, as he is wont to do with any, any project. He's going to put his name on it, regardless of who did the work. But um, this is where the one bathroom story comes from. He wanted one bathroom in the center of the center hall, so everyone had to leave their desk, walk all the way to the center hall, go to the bathroom, come back. Thankfully not. But you know, we have, we have an entrance here. We have a, a shared space. We have public spaces. Then we go to private spaces. There's a lot of offices, a lot of collaborative spaces, very few open concept areas here. The open concepts are the lunchroom. OK, that makes sense. Hallways are not meant for walking. They are meant for stopping. These are, these are hallways encouraging collaborative interaction. In fact, they put chairs in them. Designers and animators and everyone is given a budget to do their own space. They create their own little home at Pixar because you're doing 15, 20 hour days by the time you get to the end. You have to want to be there. That's the extent of a cubicle. Pretty cool. I can shut the door. I can have my own space. I can decorate it however I like. And there are big collaborative spaces too. This is an edit suite. So back here, you're not seeing it. Basically, almost is a small version of this room where people can come and watch the, the edit. Office design encourages collaboration. But we can't do that in tech companies. That is Pixar. Pixar can do whatever they want. This is Fog Creek in New York. Who's familiar with Fog Creek software? Joel Spilsky. OK. Uh, so this is the second iteration of them trying something out. They used, they, the first one they had, they, it was a much smaller office, and they made all the desks big enough to fit two chairs at, so it's easy to pair. You had a door, and then the desk continued on the outside of the door. So you could shut the door and have a private session, or you could be out in public and have a more ad hoc collaborative session. Here, same idea. We've got various setups. We've got commuters coming in that can use these kind of like temporary cubes. We've got a quiet room. We've got um, 
you know, a couple offices for various, various people to work at. Um, everything's kind of set up to enable collaboration. So the environment affects productivity and happiness. Fix it, <laughs> please. Kill the open office, figure out a way to do it. It's, I mean, and if, beg forgiveness, like literally go to Home Depot, get some sea studs, get some drywall. There's your weekend, boom, done. It'll be fun. Worst thing they're gonna say is tear it down. Well, maybe not, maybe you'll get fired, but at least you had fun doing it. <laughs> so anyway, that's the base, that's the talk. There is, this book right here is, is basically his thesis on managing creative endeavors. There's so much more in here you can't even, I mean, I barely scratched the surface today. You should read this book. There's just uh, so much you can get from it, even as wherever you are in the hierarchy in the team. Uh, I'm also working on a product right now for developers to learn UX, not just, like not the refactoring UI side of things, not the pretty, the actual underlying how this works. So check out developerux.com, fill out the form, let me know what you wanna know. And if you have any questions, I'll be around. And this is my contact info. Thank you very much. Thank you.